Dan, welcome back. Thanks for having me again. Um, you told me two minutes ago, and it slipped my mind already. You said, "Ask me something first. Say start, that I'm the host. Remember. Oh yeah, I remember of the Depolarized okay, podcast. Yeah, we never say that, right? Okay. Well, they know, and it's in the show notes, and it True. usually comes up in the episode. And I think plugs work kind of, but I don't even. I think almost ignoring it almost makes it better. Just people just go, "Yeah, that Dan guy." And they figured out. Yeah, that, I think that's fair. <laughs> but you know, Dan, your podcast is called Depolarize. Yeah, and it's just it's kind of related to what we're gonna be talking is, about. Yeah. And yeah, that's all. Yeah, and so I think it's really good too. Like you, uh, in fact, I've been meaning to poach a bunch of your guests. So if oh. you could hook me toward a few of them, yeah, I'd like to poach several away. of them, especially journalists ones and people. You know, I'm interested in talking to more people that are uh, that know stuff but aren't necessarily publicly known. You yeah, know I, mean? I don't care right. about personalities or celebrities. I want people with, right. with good information. As well. No, in fact, so. that's I think about that a lot. Uh, one time, you know, I talk with friends or with you about mm -hmm. growing my show, even, and there's a little bit of conflict because the way you grow it is you get guests that people already know. That's one way to grow. One, it, yeah. one, it's yeah. like a very simple way to grow it. But the thing is, I kind of like finding these people that are not famous but who know a know ton a lot, about yeah. something. Right. And then you, they're not, there's no image they're projecting right. or protecting. That's right. Uh, they're and better conversations because there's people aren't, yeah. uh, it's not like they're media trained to, uh, getting interviewed all the time. Yes. They have all the pot, you know, yeah. stilted kind of chambered answers of everything and the image that they're obviously up. Oh yeah, you're totally right about that. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's kind of the, that's a bit of a tension there for me, but yeah, so let's talk about this march. Mm -hmm. right, we talked about it last week. I didn't see much coverage of it. I mean, I hadn't been. I certainly don't watch the news, and I don't yeah. really look at Twitter. Very all you much, need is Facebook, all you need is the damn news from Toby, and you're right. good to that's go. That's the yeah. only news source. So I really, but but I don't I don't really follow anything. But you can feel it almost passively when something's a big deal. But I will say, all I know about it is I ain't heard anything hardly about it. Yeah, that's fine. So there was this series of marches on 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 what's normally tax day, which is April fifteenth. This mm -hmm. year was the eighteenth because of weekend and holidays. But so it's called the tax day march. Wait, is it already passed that? Yeah, yeah, it already happened. Shit, I got didn't do oh, an extension yet. You didn't do an extension? Not yeah, I need to take care of that. As yeah, that was uh, yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I know. I got an email from my accountant and said, "Can I file an extension for it?" And I was like, "Yeah," uh, but I. I Went to bed thinking I need to do that. <laughs> okay, okay, well that's yeah, that's that's unfortunate. Uh, so, so basically the the march was national. The main one was in I think in D.C. and uh, they had them all over the country. There was one in Seattle. I think there was like maybe three or four thousand people uh -huh. in Seattle, which is not nothing. Um, and it had two aims. The Washington one had two aims. The national one had one aim, which is uh, basically passing a law. That requires the Secretary of the Treasury to immediately release the tax returns of any sitting president or vice president. I believe that's every year. Yeah. Um, even while they're president. And to require major party candidates to do so in the future in order to be on the ballot. Uh -huh. And then, of course, Trump could willingly release his taxes ahead of that law. But if he didn't do it willingly, it would happen automatically. And that's like a pretty, honestly, it's a very reasonable ask. It's the kind of thing that would be good for the American people to know. Uh -huh. And there seems to really be no downside to it. And then in Washington State, the, the march was also about the regressiveness of Washington State's tax code, which I don't know as much about. But basically, the claim is that Washington's tax code disproportionately affects the poor. What does that mean? That, that would be uh, like sales tax. Because it's very sales tax heavy. There's yeah. no income tax. So yeah. the idea is a state no income, income tax. If right. you have a state income tax and a lower sales tax, you know, you talk about like uh, a poor single mother needs to go buy diapers and food and whatever. Mm -hmm. She still pays 10% sales tax just like yeah. a guy who owns a yacht. Is, yeah. 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 So everybody has to spend thirty grand a year on food and stuff. Right. And so if you only make thirty grand, now you're paying ten percent of that, all in sales tax. Yeah. Right. And if you make three hundred right. grand, you're only paying one percent of that. Right. For all the necessities of life. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. And I, I think I'm generally for a more progressive tax code. It wasn't what I was there for. I was there for the national thing. And so, a um, couple things on this. So before I went, I thought about how I wanted to do it. And I took this guy David Frum's advice, who writes for The Atlantic. He's a senior editor at The Atlantic. He's a conservative, mm -hmm. but he's kind of a Trump critic. And he said, hey, people on the left, when you're going to protest, 
here's a couple things. Number one, have a couple very specific concrete goals. Yes. Do not protest just for catharsis. I don't think there's anything wrong with catharsis. And like the Women's March got a lot of people connected to various causes. And the 10 bazillion causes. Yeah. Right. But as long as each of those causes do a good job of having specific goals, yeah. great. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, so Tax Day March was exactly that. One goal, this law. And look, if you don't agree with this law, why don't you agree with this law? It's common sense. It's sort of like the example he gives is like mothers against drunk driving. Mm -hmm. He says they are like the most pro the most effective protest group maybe in American history. In the, I guess it's like the 70s or something, mm -hmm. 60s and 70s. These moms got together. They're like, okay, we don't care. Enough. We don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. Yeah. We need harsher rules for drunk driving. It's the kind of thing really sh everyone should be behind, but mm -hmm. the car lobby didn't want that. You know, various lobbies had been pushing against that because greater regulation would mean sort of more expensive cars or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they were like, fuck that. We are going to unite for a single goal that almost everybody would I agree with. I heard of that. I'm not trying to sidetrack, but what yeah. would be the car, like who would be the lobbies against drunk driving? I mean, I'm really no, wondering. so like the laws that the laws that restrict drunk driving are like harsher sentences mm -hmm. for DUIs, right. um, mandatory seatbelt laws. Uh, I guess uh, yeah. that might be a little different for like vehicle safety. I don't remember if those happened at the same mm -hmm. time or not. But basically, it's like stricter penalties, um, lowering state limits of you know intoxication level or alcohol mm -hmm. blood level or yeah, whatever yeah, to point stuff like that. that yeah. And so you know your your standard kind of libertarian would be against that. Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that the alcohol beverage industry would have been against that because so, it would yeah. reduce their profits. I'm sure they have had a lobby. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, we don't like you know, to over-regulate bars and if you serve and who gets in trouble. That stuff's a mess. I mean, I agree with that, but I have the libertarian leaning right. intuitions is all I would say. I'm not a libertarian. but Right, but I, I think you're probably fine with, like, if the state of Washington felt like we had a lot of drunk driving fatalities and they wanted to lower it from 0 .08 to 0 .06... You'd be like, I, fine. I, I don't really think that's fine. No. Really? I don't think 0.08's that much. Oh, I disagree, dude. If I blow, so if, when friends have breathalyzers, if I blow 0.08, I'm like, dude, I would not what, what drive right it, now. What does it take for you to be 0.08? Tell, let's, let's talk about that for real. Is that okay. two IPAs? Well, so I'm like, a, no, I'm like 240 pound uh -huh. guy. So for me to get to 0.08, it's probably yeah, it's more four, or f four drinks over two hours yeah and that's, those might I be like I mean, manhattan's about, yeah. you know whiskey drinks or something yeah i think that's i think if that's the case i mean you know it's hard to tell that it's so subjective and different for every it's not subjective but it's different for every person yeah so you, you, don't, you don't I, know but i have well, a fear when i drink two ipas at a bar with somebody me and you have drinks and i'm driving home that i could be in trouble for that and if you drink me off so bad and it's never happened and I'm, i don't know but i don't think that i don't want that i don't want some limit to get down to where i'm in danger for doing that I don't like that. If you have two 16 ounce 9% IPAs, then not you should be worried like about it. I'm just saying, yeah. in general, I would like to be able to have two drinks somewhere and not worry about getting a I don't. I think you don't have to worry about that given how tall you are. Okay. But, but like. I, if the you, limit would encroach that, it would really. A be short a woman or something yeah. should. I mean, yeah. look, I, I don't. I mean. To put it bluntly, Carter, I'm really sad that you. I'm really sorry for you that you're frustrated that I'm you might frustrated. be over the I limit. Point oh eight's got it. That's <laughs> just all buy saying. a breathalyzer. Make it. You know. No, I'm not against. Maybe. I'm not maybe. Anything. I'm just saying there's there will be a limit to where it would bother me. Point oh eight may be fine. I don't yeah. have the data on what it actually is for me. Yeah. But I you it could it would encroach eventually to a level where the the mentality's like even one. Point oh one is too much. But here's it, the thing. But so, why? Yeah. I mean, who cares? Like, so you Uber, and there becomes an industry that. Gr I mean, you're a free market guy. Say you make it point oh two instead of point oh eight. That means basically I could have an IPA at a bar, I mean, I don't and that's know it. That, that, that that's true though. Well, let's just say you did that because this is what it is in like Europe, in most countries of Europe. It's a very harsh thing. the The level is very low. Yeah. Designated drivers don't drink at all in mm -hmm. Britain. For I'm instance. not pro drunk driving or anything. Okay, but let's just no, let's just let's just follow this for a minute. Mm -hmm. So let's say you enact that law, and you experts believe it will save a bunch of lives and a bunch of property damage mm -hmm. for people buzz driving and just throw in the fact that people text all the time while they're driving as well. It, it, so yeah. it, even just one or two beers and then a funny text thread with some buddies, and you know you can combine those two, and they might equal. 
a point ten, you know, point one yes. alcohol, whatever. So let's say you make it mm-hmm. really strict. Okay. And you're just like, man, I'm so bummed. I used to be able to get two IPAs. Now I can't. What's going to happen if that's a law all the way across the land? Well, cheaper Uber services will come up, pools from bars, because nobody drives home from the bar. And if no one's driving home from the bar, there is a business opportunity for someone who owns a minivan to say, hey, we're leaving Greenwood bars at 9 p.m. You got an app. Somebody will make that app and make hundred million dollars no, way out now I think no out why now. not well because people ignore laws when they get stupid <laughs> that's why i'm saying people drink, drink drink and drive just unlimited now way over the limit they just that doesn't well really some stop people do that but it's for sure true that guys like you and i who are reasonable like who you, don't drink and drive it's like the speed limit i mean you're just gonna speed i mean it just doesn't matter no I mean, that's you just go, like, you for sure keep false. on lowering the speed limit and andy would save lives so let's go down to 45 it would inevitably save tens of thousands of lives if the top speed anywhere was 30 miles an hour we would save tens of thousands of lives a year okay huge so, but okay, we don't but need to keep in, taking that down until we're back to r- driving golf carts i understand that. what you're saying but here's why the analogy to the speed limit does not make sense with a speed limit you have a trade-off of safety and efficiency mm-hmm. okay because it matters that the economy is efficient it matters that so people we'll sacrifice get, those ten thousand lives for a better economy. That's well, what we've that is essentially yeah, what I happens. Understand. And then with, and we will within also that, for our freedoms to drill, drink a couple of beers, we will make that except sacrifice. Except there's and no, we, have. we do, we have. But that's I'm saying, tra- and it's called liberty. I mean, I'm not, you know what I mean? That's just called free, individual freedom to I know. some degree instead of a nanny state. We just don't want to head too far that direction. It'll eventually trigger everybody to where they're like, enough. But some people got to look out for it on the front end of that. I'm okay, saying. but to to say like. This one area of intoxicated driving, mm-hmm. that I don't think that that is necessarily the nanny state. I don't think it's unreasonable that you take a particular issue like that, which really, you yes, people do drive buzz, but they shouldn't. And people do drive drunk, but they shouldn't. Mm-hmm. But there's not an efficiency level for the economy like there is with the speed limit. I, I would go another direction too, which is I usually don't think regulation and policy are the most effective ways of ch- of change of well problems. i would Either. just challenge they're, you they're then like to the la- google maybe a last resort and in some cases work really well but i would still i would challenge you to google the rates of drunk di- drunk driver fatality in europe and in the united states mm-hmm. and i think you would there's so many reasons for that it's not that is just too that's it's a, but it's almost all the policy the set up the way the they drink is, more the same. than us mm-hmm. they drink more than us they spend more time at bars than we do. They don't. They don't live. They don't. It's it's a different way. They live in different urban centers and suburban commute type things. All those things are different. It's a different they, culture entirely. That's true. And some of that culture grows up around mm-hmm. shared values. That yeah. and I'm shared saying shared values look affect culture. Culture Please would come. Yeah. Culture would come up around a law that restricted drunk driving more. Uh, it would. Let me give you a counter example or okay. an illustration of this. When we were out touring a bunch, we were asked and seen as influential enough at some point. Yeah. Uh, I believe this is true. I can't remember exactly. But somebody said, a politician person, when y'all are playing in D.C., somebody wants you to come to the, I think, Capitol building? I don't even remember because, like I said, not that tuned into politics. And I think yeah. it was Rick Santorum asked Emory <laughs> to come by the uh, okay. ca- somewhat, whatever, wherever the politicians yeah. were. And he wanted to talk to us, or I, I, we met him, shook his hand, but he had his aides and people there. And he came to us, and, and, and they said, listen, you guys are influential. You matter in culture. What you do matters. And we're politicians, and this is what we do, but we know. And they told us this in this boardroom. And they said, we know that, we're, that, that culture is much more impactful than politics about change. And the thing I think that they were talking about and cared about at that time was abortion. They were saying, or they said at least, and they gave us all these stats and showed it, and their whole point was, listen, what we do is not as effective as what you do, is basically their point. And they said, sure. we have the, and they showed the charts and stats of how when 
abortion was made, Ill the rate of abortion and how it was increasing steadily each year, and then they made it illegal, and the abortion rate continued to rise uniformly with no impact. Once yeah. it became illegal, the amount of total abortions that occurred continued at exactly the same rate of yeah. rising. So, And I think drunk driving and a lot of things are that same way. I'll always remember that illustration and the acknowledgement from a politician in his office that what they do doesn't matter. That's not the words they use, but that was what was obviously they were basically saying that if Bono's out there advocating for a thing and people listen to him that's a positive thing versus a restrictive regulation coming later that people are going to ignore well, and okay. resist and disagree with okay and great polarize and all that crap so this is so perfect technology though. and culture will drive change and that's why politics and this is the hyperbolic statement of mine don't matter okay so fine we don't agree on all of Except that but this is great affects people take their liberties away drive them crazy <laughs> cause more problems and monopolies and market problems. oh man anyway. okay well maybe but so that's perfect. So the Mothers Against Drunk Driving changed the culture. Mm -hmm. They presented right. a united they front. They may push some regulations they like to, and that's fine. And then but. those regulations and that shift in culture dramatically reduced drunk di drunk driving mm -hmm. fatalities. Okay, but, but it's it's frowned upon culturally. Like it's we both. made it a pariah it's both. thing, yes. and that's really yes. good. And that's really good. That's really good. But some of that was that's where you, the millions of lobby dollars would be better spent, in my opinion, in technology and culture change. That's well, what I that's and that's interesting. But by making a DUI so expensive mm -hmm. and so limiting and sure. now you can't go to Canada you can't yeah. go party with your friends across the border mm -hmm. I mean these things do affect culture sure. some of those policies yeah. do. okay so the point just being that's effective protest it is crossing party lines mm -hmm. it is common sense and it's like a thing that people can get behind that they didn't even know they needed to care about and now they really care last, about it less kind of sub counterpoint to that would be war on drugs the same thing bipartisan we got to get rid of these bad things that are, are bad in society and then you just go after it go after war, it, war on then, drugs was not a cultural movement it was it's what you're talking about it's totally top down mm -hmm. it's like here's how we're going to deal with this as governors well and once lawmakers. you whip everybody up and get especially bipartisan support of something that is based in fear like yeah. drugs or out, drunk driving sounds but i mean it's bad i mean it really yeah. is and drugs the effects of some drug stuff is but that those can things can dead end straight into a very regressive thing too, yeah right where you're just penalizing sure the people that are disadvantaged anyway anyway well and the reason that mothers against drunk driving is the best example is because it, it just it is the best yeah. example so you're using the you're using mm -hmm. the kind of perfect one and there's failed examples right but so okay so the tax march is an example of a clear aim that most people should be able to get behind. I had dinner with my in-laws and my, my wife's extended family, all of whom are Republicans. Basically, everyone I talked to was like, I don't even know why that's not a law already. Mm -hmm. They all agreed, right? I waved my American flag. I brought, I got a huge American flag and brought it with me, like five feet long, which was another one of David Frum's suggestions of like, hey, in the current moment, the right has kind of appropriated patriotic symbols in america mm -hmm. but why what does the flag stands for it stands for america yeah if financial transparency from the president is an american value mm -hmm. then it's represented in the flag mm -hmm. and there's no reason to have like american flag crossed out at an amer at a they demonstration i mean no one did at this one but like who does that i don't know i mean people burn flags sometimes on these far left the yeah. far left groups will burn flags and demonstrations and i get what they're saying which is they're saying, may you know, best case scenario, they're saying this isn't American anymore or something. It's not America. Mm -hmm. But if you're marching for the sake of America to be better, yeah, use its symbols. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sing the anthem yeah. or whatever, right? I mean, like, sing God bless America. Maybe if you're not religious, you don't want to. But so I did that. I got on TV because I said, hey, there's a camera guy there interviewing people. I'm going to offer if he would like to know why I'm waving a flag. Uh, it was just like, I was like, hey, do you want, if you want, um, you know, you can ask me why I'm Were you on the news? waving the flag. Yeah, so I was on Cairo News, which nice. is, I think, CBS or whatever. Yeah. And uh, he ended up not using the part about the flag, but he used the part where I, I sort of expressed clearly the aims of the march mm -hmm. and had a flag behind me. And I was kind, and I was tr trying to, I was conciliatory, I was reaching out to the other side. And I don't say that to brag. I'm just, the point is like, it can be done. Like mm -hmm. you can, like we don't have to just rage against the right if we're on the left. We don't have to just rage against protators. It's more fun though. If we're on the right. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's more fun. It's also really damaging. It's good entertainment for those <laughs> that participate in it, I suppose. Yeah. That's what I feel mainly. But so so it went well. Cathartic, yeah. But I did have I did have an experience that didn't go well with, with this, this couple that um there was a a white man and a white woman. Yuck. And the woman was holding up a big sign that said white dudes are a bummer. <laughs> And uh, and so, but I want to save that because I want to talk about this this model that I woke up with the other morning, and then we're gonna come back to that qu- and then talk about it. So, can we transition? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I'm working on this curriculum. Maybe it'll be a book. Maybe it's a class. Maybe it's some videos. You and I have talked about it. Of um, ba- I, I kind of think of calling it something like the church in a polarized society. Uh-huh. So the idea is like. Using some of the language from this Jonathan Haidt book we've been talking about, The Righteous Mind, and uh, other psychological facts about how our brains work, and then applying that to the church, thinking about, um, like, basically, where does a church fit in? Should the church be polarizing people? Should it be depolarizing people? What does it mean to have an identity as a, a believer, mm-hmm. a Christian, or whatever? So I need a, I, I have this visual idea, and uh, Reva is going to put these in the comments now on the live stream. Okay. And if you're listening on the podcast, breakitdownpod.com. That's it. And they'll already we'll be up. The, we'll you can look a, at this thing. A screenshot of this up. Yeah, in the but website. I figured I needed something with it that I could draw a circle around, and I was like, what better? Then a record sleeve, and I thought, Talk hey, about a plug. might as well grab the Sherwood record, because mm-hmm. it did come out a little less than a year ago. Uh, anyway, so. So you drew it on your, your I drew band's it record on my sleeve. own okay. band's record sleeve, and this one is, this is the, the second version. So Reva is going to put up the first photo right now before I cross everything out. But I'm just, this is for you and me. Okay. So it's simplified, but because you're never only by yourself or in a group top and bottom if you're not uh okay so if you're not looking right now let me just describe this to you it's a circle at the top is you it's a little person of you at the Mm -hmm. bottom is you in a group of people Mm -hmm. and then it circles around to the right and then back up again to the left and i'm trying to show this cycle that occurs an individual reading news or listening to Mm -hmm. ideas or listening to a podcast whatever then interacting with their group, their tribe, their friends, and then being marketed to back to where they are. They get marketed to and they get a new piece of information, Mm -hmm. an article, a brand, whatever. So, And then that cycle just sort of always is happening. So it goes in and out of you being alone and receiving information, then then what you do with that, and then you bring in and reflect that with the group. In a group setting. Process it, and then you go back into isolation. Yeah, and actually much of, nowadays, much of our group processing is done online and is public information for marketers Mm -hmm. and algorithms, Mm -hmm. and that affects what you get. So so basically, the the, the reason for the delineation between being alone and being in a group is that most of what we read and hear, we read and hear alone. Mm Mm-hmm. But then we, we exist things largely alone, alone, but we exist in a group, right? And we, we all do yeah. more many groups. OK, yeah. so here's how this works. So you start up top and here's here you are. You're at whatever point in time in your life and you are absorbing information. Do you want to start with a specific example? Or yeah. So let's just like, like to say I'm listening to a podcast while I'm doing trash and clean up at home. By OK, myself, yeah, I'm yeah. listening to a podcast. And yeah. because I'm a person on the left. I'm listening to the Ezra Klein show, okay. who is the owner of Vox News, which is like a left-leaning mm-hmm. website, and he's interviewing. Let's just say, let's use David Frum, my guy from earlier. So he's interviewing a conservative guy, David Frum. This is a really good one. It's like a great conversation that they actually had. But so I'm listening to this podcast. Okay, now I'm listening to it by myself, and as I do, as we go down from me to the group, confirmation bias happens. Mm-hmm. This is something that you talk about quite a bit, and yeah. we've already talked about. Um, I'm pretty pleased with the amount of that that notions out there and people understand. It's yes. something I've always been pretty aware of, but I'm happy that it's kind of, people are starting to. It's kind of in the common vernacular now. Yeah, I'm, it's, glad, about I'm glad about that too. So, for those of you who aren't that familiar, I like the way that Jonathan Haidt talks about it. He said the difference between "can I believe it" and "must I believe yes. it." Yes, yeah. Let's let's let's, unpack let's talk about that. that. So. Confirmation bias is can I believe it versus must I believe it. Can I believe it is we already want to believe something is true. Mm -hmm. 
And then someone tells us that it might be, or we think, we wonder if it might be true. And we just need we one go, little, we just need one, one reason to justify yes. that I could believe this. Yes. That's the easiest Can thing I? in the world. So let's use conspiracy theory as the biggest yep. example. It's like, is the earth flat? Well, you know, it, I, that would be fun to believe. I'd like to believe yeah. it. It would validate a lot of stuff. But I need some awesome evidence, though. I can't just go around thinking something so goofy as that. But I sure would like to. Yeah. Well... Somebody sends you a YouTube video. It says, "Well, when you look out over the horizon, it's it's not curved. Sure now, looks is it? flat. Sure looks flat to me." And you go, "See, maybe there is something here." And you find maybe one other little shred of something. Yeah. And you go, "See, I, I can believe it." Like, yeah. I'm not saying I'm a hundred percent sure, but it could be true. And I, you know, this is me. I think now I have some justification. I can believe a thing. Yeah, or faked moon landing, for instance, yeah. right? It's like, well, there look at this. One really crazy look thing. at this Maybe lens that. flare. Yeah. That right. sure looks like it's done in a right. soundstage, and yeah. uh, and then all of a sudden, like the fact that you get thousands of enough. people yeah. worked for NASA, and you know, you 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 have something you, you can only latch need onto. One little thing for that's can I believe? Can it? I believe this? Yeah. Then the opposite side of that is must I believe it? Yeah. So someone says to you, "Hey, you know, Trump's actually sexist." And you go, well, I don't, I don't want to. Must I believe that he's sexist? Yeah. And then they go, look at this Hollywood Access tape. Here is him claiming this. And you go, well, there could well, be another I mean, explanation. Yeah, so. I mean, it's locker room. People talk about maybe it never happened or whatever. That's must I believe it? I don't want to believe it. And now I can dismiss that claim. Yeah. Or I mean, and it's not even just stuff like that. It's even scientific paradigms would go the same way. Yes. Like if you're going from Newtonian physics to relativity. It's like at first it sounds goofy or quantum stuff. It sounds super goofy. And you're like, well, you know, and, until it's just verified to you have to believe that an electron is not in a specific location at a certain yep. point. You you're just not going to until you must believe until it. Until you must yeah. believe it. And yep. then the kooks could believe it right as soon as well we got one funny test result here we go you know I yes can't believe it, so. and and so that's a good way to think about it scientific paradigms let's say you're going from newtonian to quantum physics there are people who are going to be really prone to believing that the old paradigm is dead because of their confirmation bias mm -hmm. at the beginning mm -hmm. and then there are going to be people who hold out to the very end because of their confirmation yeah. bias and where you want to be is somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. You want to basically get rid of either side of confirmation bias if you can and just look at things clearly if possible mm -hmm. or as clearly as possible. So you start with yourself. You're reading. You're listening to a show. You have confirmation bias as you're listening. Ezra Klein is making points. David Frum is making points. They disagree on a lot of those points. Whenever, if you're on the left, whatever Ezra Klein says, you will tend to agree and you will think like, can I believe what he just said? Yeah, I can I'm that. a leftist. Okay, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, I'm on his side. Right. Like, that sounds reasonable. How come David Frum hasn't come up with a good answer to that? Yeah. If you are listening and you're conservative, mm -hmm. you will go, Ezra's not hearing what he's saying at all. Like, right? right. So you'll do it no matter where you land. Yeah, okay? it's like when you watch a debate and it's like, dude, Ken Ham destroyed Bill Nye on that one. Yes. Or something. Yeah, you, yeah, for yeah. if you're a young earth creationist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those debates are a great example. Like the they both walk, walk away like they destroyed. Theist, yeah, atheist-theist debates. Yeah. Like People will share the same video to different people for different reasons. For the exact same thing and say, see? How could it be so successful yeah. on yeah. both sides? Which is probably why those debates happen, because they get shared a bunch yeah, on nonsense. both sides. Yeah. So anyway, now you're in your group, okay? And this is, of course, it's simplified. You're not, you don't go from being alone to being in your group, but just for the sake of thinking through it. Okay, yeah. so you're at, start at the top. We're coming down the circle. Mm -hmm. We have confirmation bias, and now we're in our group. Now, two things, probably more than two things, but at least two things affect us. We have a tribal identity. Human beings are a tribal species. We came up as tribes. We exist in various tribes. So, for instance, some of the tribes I'm in, I'm in uh, center left. 30 somethings mm -hmm. who are Christian but have had problems with the church. Yeah. That's a tribe. I'm in the tribe of mu musicians who have toured the country or the world. That's a certain tribe I'm in. That's I speak the people. language. Yeah, it's my people. Um, what else? Homeowners, people who are like, I don't know, who have these concerns about their homes or something mm -hmm. like that. You're There's, in the Coke tribe. I mean, we're this way. Yeah, like my family, yeah. uh, we like chaos. Uh, my family is like the door is open, it's revolving. You're always welcome in. We can handle as much chaos the way we as are. you can throw at us. You know, my wife is more like I like it to be ordered, and then if it's ordered, I can provide hospitality yeah. to people. Right. So sh we have different tribes. We have some that were in the same tribe. Uh, you know, when the Daily Show was on, 
with John Stewart, that's a big old tribe of people who are like, we identify with the way that the Daily Show views the news and politics. Okay. Yeah. So we're in tribes. There's all these tribes. Got it. Trump Trump supporters or rally goers, it's a tribe. All of it. Now we're in our tribe. So we have this identity. And what our friends believe or our tribe members believe in how they act, it, it becomes a part of how we see ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we are very reluctant to change anything about that for obvious reasons. But it's important to remember a lot of our tribal identity is random. It's chance. Yeah, it's just where you are, the time and place. I am only a like old millennial post-evangelical because... I was born in 1983 in California mm -hmm. to baby boomers who went to an evangelical church. Right. I would not have those concerns yeah. if I were born in 1965 in Russia. Right. Right. So it's tribal identity is a little scary because it's so arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Okay. One other thing that operates on us when we're in the group is group bias. It's called group homogeneity effect is the official term for it. But psychologists have showed this This is a real phenomenon when they test people uh that you know they, they sort of trick them in these psychological experiments a lot of times where they say we're testing for this but they're really right, right. so they have these experiments and I'm, I'm not doing well at remembering all the details but basically if they can show they show a photo of a of a person who uh is like them or they'll do the name of the person is like Muhammad or it's David or whatever. If when the person that's being evaluated by the person in the experiment, when they are in group, they get better scores. All other things being equal. So, you know, you say, um, you know, David robbed a bank, but he was poor because his parents hit him and his wife had their kids at the, you know, the shelter, and so he's trying to get out of poverty. And then you go, uh, you say, Abdul robbed a bank, mm -hmm. and his he was in poverty, and yeah. his wife is shelter. Like so, something like that. People will give David white people will give David a higher score than Abdul. Yeah, and and the reverse. Muslims and or everywhere. blacks yeah, would yeah. give Abdul right. So we do this. We do it. Mm -hmm. It's actually really hard to acknowledge that about yourself. Mm -hmm. It kind of fucks with you to think. Oh, like I have group bias. Yeah, but we do. We do yeah, it. Yeah, you just you have to. I mean, racism. I, I I always say would just start over again if you wipe the slate clean. If you just set up some of the same things a couple generations in, it would just kind of be back. You know, it's just an right. inherent way that you're more f at least you could say, if nothing else, fearful of things that you just have less knowledge about. That's yeah. kind of at the root of racism. I mean, it yeah. You just well, it's a little scarier because I don't know the way these people talk. Like if other go, people, you know, yeah. The first few times I went to an Indian restaurant, I was like, "Oh, these people are, are Indians mean." <laughs> I mean, you know, like that's, that's oh, a non-statement. Yeah. I just like just because uh, their their customer or service is like, it, yeah, yeah, right, right. And so that's so. And then I go home and tell my kids, "Well, you know, how Indians are they're yeah. this way." And then those and then my kids are racist now. I mean, they yep. they don't know that that's just you know what I'm saying like my ignorance passed to them even worse and there you go so but it just comes out of at least ignorance or fear of something different you know what I'm saying yeah no it's true so we do this thing and we have these biases okay and then this is the interesting thing about our modern world as we go back to our individual lives which of course they're never totally disconnected we go online whatever and something that we fail to appreciate a lot of the time is <laughs> how consistently we are marketed to. Yeah. And I think that this has become a lot more clear as people learn about the algorithms on like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, mm -hmm. and Google Analytics. Mm -hmm. But basically, there is a trillions of dollar industry to figure out what kind of articles you will click on. Mm -hmm. And even among all of the articles that your own Facebook friends will share, Facebook knows which ones you like. That's right. And which ones you click on, which That's gives right. them ad revenue. Mm -hmm. um, because They're going to show you. I was just listening to a podcast about this and somebody I'm going to try and get on the show. But they're going to show you what you've shown them. You're likely to simply – it's the only thing that's rewarded as of now on, in the internet ad culture is time spent on 
platform site. That that's the bottom line. So yep. it's gonna it knows what your habits are, but arbitrarily, like it doesn't even know. So it's basically an AI selecting for the things that you tell it you want by the fact how long you linger on a post as you're scrolling through wow. and it measures the milliseconds wow. like and if it's and it has all these ai categories if it had these keywords and it had this visual and it had yep. this language and it had this and so it knows to show you more of those so it even knows your scrolling habits yeah yeah so so i was Jeez. like i said this before i saw i see my wife looking at something at a, uh, some article about Trump that makes her angry at three in the morning when the after the baby cries or something. I'm like, you have to stop doing that. They're just going to give you more of this, and which is you know, true. She's, and but the computers, I mean, there's humans back there that know, but the AIs are basically are, are like they're not even intentional. They don't even know what it is, but they are selecting for things like outrage. Yes, for instance, because, because it, if something it, is it, more outrageous, that's what you're going to do, and they need yep. more time on site is the thing that's selected for. Yes, exactly. And so it's better and better at it. it's this weird Darwinian algorithm. Uh, instead of survival of an organism, it's you spend more time on Facebook.com. Yeah, or on that's your right. app. That's what is currently. That's selected. the only thing they want. The more time you're on Facebook, the more time you're on YouTube, mm -hmm. all of this stuff. The more time you're there, the more money they make. Yeah, and that's always been true. And that's media. always been true, but. It was not always true. Like, okay, imagine 1955. Mm -hmm. uh, there's three papers you could subscribe to. You get, you live in Columbus. You get the Columbus Herald, or you can get the Boston Globe or the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Washington Post or the LA Times or something. You have a few things. There's a little bit of selection. The coffee shop you go to or the diner you go to knows that because it's a working class neighborhood, well, nobody really likes the Boston Globe. They li or nobody likes the Times. They like the Boston Globe. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's some selection. So you'll get a whole newspaper from the Boston Globe instead of a whole newspaper from the New York Times, and they have a slant, and it will change some things about you over time. But it's not that precise. It's not near. As, no, know, precise. maybe you're the yeah, guy. Yeah. Maybe you're the guy in that so Columbus how, neighborhood. That's how publications who, originally wound up with slants. Now Facebook has sure. every slant. Customized to you, including fake ones yeah. by Russian hackers, right? Including people who are just see, click basically. farm people who are just yeah. who are totally you know writing fake stuff. It's anything, yeah. And so we have to acknowledge that. Yeah. So as we complete this loop in our minds from in the group back to the single individual, after we've experienced our confirmation bias, our tribal identity, and our group bias, now we get marketed to with tremendous power and precision yeah. the things we already believe yeah. and then we you're and then, setting yourself back you're setting yourself up back to go into isolation to receive more information to receive more information further confirmation bias about yes. and keep on moving and then of course the cycle keeps going yeah. and going and going and going so that's why I wanted to do it in a circle mm -hmm. now how can we interrupt this cycle how we break well let cycle. me jump back into yeah. this thing in the middle that really interests me when you say this and it's a phenomenon that i've not haven't le learned about other than i've observed it and that's you whatever you consume by yourself and i put this in musical terms and you just tell me how this makes sense how this works but if i work on a song and make a mix or a rough mix of a song i'm working on and i listen to it i do it until i'm done i do it until it sounds perfect yeah you know then I say, Dan or Toby, are you guys coming in here and listen to this? And then I play it back for a group of people. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm like, holy shit, this is not right. I mean, even before they, even I'm looking, like just listening to it in the presence of other people makes me hyper aware of what I think. And I'm almost totally. certain they're hearing that yep. I wasn't hearing before, even before they say it. Just we're social creatures, we're wired that way. And I'm like, oh crap, or that joke didn't land, or that song part of that song, I, I bet they hear that as out of tune. But I didn't hear as out of tune until I observed them hearing it. Yep. And even without their feedback. And then on top of that, if they do get feedback, I, I'm just going to be, I'm either going to be super defensive about it, but or more likely just be super influenced by the yeah. people that happen to make up my group. And if I was going off in some direction, like more experimental musically, then that would rein me back in. Unless I yeah. got very specific feedback, like that chance you took, that outside thing was really, really good, then I'm going to round off my edges and just get back to what the group thinks. I get in with the other five guys in the band and they're like, you're doing what with that guitar tone? Are you crazy? No, yeah. you make it normal. I go, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, y'all are right. Y'all are probably right. Right, and and so different bands, for yeah. instance, that you combine those personalities, they're going to all, and that's where we get the great variety of musical mm -hmm. options that we have. And that's excellent for music. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm saying even still, you're you're brought back to you have to fight to do anything different. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to wind back up where people expect you to be or a, sm- a small. You're just talking group. about the the strength of identity, the strength of social being identity. Around a group yes, is, and be, us being yes. social creatures is profound. I mean, if you listen to a pe- something that you've created around other people, you feel it so differently. So same with your political ideas. Yeah. I imagine, like you know, I was thinking that moon landing thing was it. Are you crazy? Yeah, yeah, I was probably crazy. I don't know. You're yeah, right, you're right, you're right. right. But if I had, the more I continue in isolation and bolster those ideas, yeah. then I'm, maybe I'll go down that path or I'll find friends that are flat earthers, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, identity, so I guess what you're saying is that identity can be good, right? It, like, it's, yeah, maybe social it has pressure a has a good... you out. Like, yeah. You know, maybe We're talking about drunk driving. conformity or something. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, if you're a person with two DUIs, like, hopefully there's some social pressure right. exerted right. on you to be like, hey, dude, get your act together. Right. Right. Yeah, or my grandma would say, you're no better than the company you keep. Right. Or no, but to be more accurate, you're no different than that. You will be alike the company you, you keep. You will be like the company you keep. And this is... I think there's a lot of science coming out about teenagers and and preteens as well that like the biggest single determiner as to whether or not a a kid does drugs, has sex too early, whatever is like what are their friends doing? Yeah. That's the number That's one it. thing. Yeah. And the best thing you can do as a parent in that regard is like get them with good friends, which you don't have total control over, of mm-hmm. course. Uh but it's the same thing. Groups are really yeah. really 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 powerful. And the thing that is so powerful today that we don't realize is the marketing and the algorithms Mm -hmm. are so powerful. And it's all unseen. That's why it works. If we were aware of it, it wouldn't work. Yeah. Right? So how do we break this cycle? Make people aware of it. Right. So I can think of four ways. Basically, I'm thinking of it as like three no's and a yes. Okay. Okay. So going down from top to bottom, confirmation bias. Be aware of your confirmation bias. How do you do that? You just... It's hard to catch yourself in this, but it just helps to be reminded of it. I One thing I do is uh, that I've started tricking myself. So I like Obama. I was an Obama guy. Mm-hmm. I supported him both, both elections. And I notice, I catch myself not reading critical stories about Obama. And so I try and read them. Like I, that's just a thing I try and catch myself about because mm-hmm. I know I have confirmation bias about Obama. Uh, if you are a Trump supporter... That might be your confirmation bias. Like, hey, read some stuff, especially if it's from the right, that criticizes him. That doesn't say he's an illegitimate president yeah. or whatever, but that criticizes him in a helpful way, in a healthy way. So one first no is no to confirmation bias. The second no is no to tribe identity as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Just acknowledge the various tribes you're in. Uh there, there's so many to choose from here. It's but. just, just well, I mean, what you're saying is like uh, intentionality or mindfulness. Oh, you have intentionality written down. That's where I got that. But it's mindfulness of just, yeah. um, just na- it's, uh, it's an exercise the same as people tend to lose weight if they simply write down, the first step of a diet is write down everything that you eat for two mm. weeks. People yeah. tend to lose weight if they do that. Hmm. Because you just you just look at it and you're like, geez, that's a lot of milkshakes. Yeah. Or you, for me, it'd be that's a lot of frappuccinos. Yeah, you write it down you're like, oh shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, guess I can't I did. do that. Yeah, right. And yeah, that's it. I had four frappuccinos last mm-hmm. week. Yeah, right. Okay, so it's just naming it. Like that's it. Yeah. If you wanted, to, yeah. So if you want to do an ex- exercise, write bias. down I'm every tribe, tribe, write down every group that you are a part of, and think of a few things that people in that group would by default believe or do. Yeah. And just name it. Okay, and then group bias. This one's hard. This one is really hard. It's so automatic, and it's actually maybe even a little bit more subtle than confirmation bias. But check yourself. If you see a person of a different group and you find an unconscious uh, assumption you make about them, just remember that, sure, some stereotypes exist because there are true things associated with them, but each individual member of a group does not always conform to that stereotype. Mm-hmm. And you as a human oh, yeah. will you will be much more likely to include them in the stereotype than to not include them in the mm-hmm. stereotype. But you can remind yourself, I do this. I have group bias. Yeah. I have in-group and out-group thinking, but it's random. I just happen to be in this group. And if I was in their group, I would think that yeah. way about me. So those are the three no's. You, I would like to suggest to people to look for the ways in once you identify the group you're in, even if it's your, just your church or your family or whatever, 
the it, like ca- calculate the percentage of how much or you're the left or the right or whatever even the broad category like Republican calculate the percentage of how how much stuff you line up with the norm of that group and hmm. for many people it would be it, it's near a damn hundred percent yeah and that's a real problem that all, that it that that isn't an accident yeah that's not an accident that you happen to find a group that agrees with everything you think 100%. So the closer you are to that, you're a sheep, my friend. I mean, it's not just happens to be the right answer. I mean, because the, the tendencies you think, yeah, no, because it's right. That's why we all think it. But it's yes. because, or you, it's because you're a sheep and you've rounded all your answers into this. So right. feel free and be bold as you can to say, I am this, but I totally am not that. That will help your whole group understand that they can be diverse too. I mean, it takes yep. some brave people to say, yeah, but... I think, you know, I'm definitely, I'm as left as it gets, but I think abortion is stupid. Yeah, I was just going to say, it takes just a brave, it takes a be brave that. person to say, hey, I mostly, I vote Democrat, but I really, I think that this abortion policy is too far. You know, I, I, I want to see, this. yeah, it's okay. just do it. Like, it feels like you need to, I mean, I don't know, just, it's okay to be that, and yeah. you, you would want that if you would think about it. So, if you're a dumb dumb, if you, if you line up straight ticket with any group, in yeah. my opinion. And then, so then, my little stupid way of saying it is three no's and a yes. The yes is, how do you fight against the algorithms and the marketing? You intentionally choose your sources. So this is something that has been helpful for me. I have just mm-hmm. decided to do a lot less Facebook news, a lot less Twitter news. I have an Economist subscription, and I have a New York Times subscription. A little bit left, a little bit right. I get all my news pretty much from those sources, unless a really great article pops up or an a writer I like and I just am not I'm just not participating in the hysteria outrage machine I just have chosen not to I am not allowing the marketers to market to me as much I'm just opting out and instead I'm choosing my own sources which I have thought about ahead of time asked a couple people said hey if I want a balanced news source give me two or three things that I should be checking and stick to it Mm -hmm. and then that will help this this cycle of just getting more information that of course I already agree with. Mm-hmm. That's my that's well, and all this is important because you, when there's new frontiers, you, you just kind of get sucked into it before you realize what it is. If you don't understand what it is, it's like, I mean, the digital space could be is so prominent, and you feel like it's not under your control, but nonetheless, it's not. It's kind of like your yard or yeah. something. I mean, it's yours to maintain. Yeah. And it's going to be more that way in the future. And you don't want to be have cars up on blocks in your yard and hadn't cut your grass. You don't own a weed eater. I mean, come on. <laughs> you got to do your part. You know, yeah. cra- build your environment. It's your environment to craft and design. Yeah. The, your online habits and everything. And it's, yeah. And you got to be even more careful because it's, you know, it, it's coming at you with intelligence. It's not It's not simple as, as your yard yeah. or the other previous things but you you can you you're going to build what you consume you're, it's your choice and and if you if you're it's crazy yeah. if you're not in charge of it who is if you're not well the answer is if you're not in charge of it the in charge of it the algorithms and the marketing yeah then you, are. you're just you're then you're like sub human in the in like you know what i mean you, then you've become subordinate to marketing and companies and machines i mean that's like a will it's like yeah. a voluntary all right put plug me into the matrix and use me for your BTUs or whatever. Dude, it's like, the punk rocker in me just hates that. Yeah. Like that that's where I love leaning into like being raised on punk rock of like, fuck you. Yeah. Don't tell me what to read. Yeah. I'm gonna find I'm gonna find good sources and I'm gonna read what I want to read. Mm-hmm. And I, I try and lean into that. Yeah, punk when rockers have immaculate it. yards in landscaping. <laughs> I have it's always been a thing. <laughs> well I think that we're out of time, right? But we'll so we'll pick up the story of the white dudes are a bummer yeah, yeah, yeah. next I would, week. I'd like to. Sounds good. Thanks, Dan. Thank you.